Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Today we're going to be taking a look at topic number 11, titled Minerals and Rocks. So the first part of this topic is going to be minerals. And what you see in this picture is a group of different minerals. Now, they all look very different, but in fact, they are actually all the same mineral, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. So starting with minerals, what is a mineral? Meaning when you look at them, a lot of you are going to confuse minerals with rocks. They are not the same thing. So minerals have four major characteristics that make them unique. First, minerals are naturally occurring, meaning that they do occur in nature, right? And they are not made by people. Second, right? They are inorganic, meaning they were never alive. Remember, something that is organic is something that was previously alive. So minerals never were alive. So something isn't going to die and make a mineral. Next, they have a definite chemical composition and a crystalline structure, meaning that if you were to look inside the mineral at how it was built, right, it's going to have a very um, specific structure and it's going to be made of a single type of chemical composition. Right? And lastly, minerals have to be solid. No liquids, no gases here. Okay, just solids. Now, another thing when we take, take a look at rocks, right? Rocks are going to be made up of either several minerals. This is what is known as polymineralic. These are going to be the most common ones that we look at, right? But there are also rocks that could also be made of just one kind of mineral, and these are known as monomineralic, right? And again, this prefix mono means one. Right, whereas the prefix poly here right, means many. Okay, so polymineralic rocks are made up of many different minerals, whereas monomineralic rocks are only going to be made up of one mineral. Okay, now just a little bit of extra information. You don't have to copy this. Okay, so all minerals are rocks, but not all rocks are minerals. Why? Because not all rocks are composed of minerals, right? A rock has to be naturally formed, right? And is part of the earth. So most rocks are going to be composed of minerals, but some rocks are going to be either made up of organic material, meaning if something dies, it can be turned into a rock. For example, coal, right? Or glassy materials that are not minerals, right? Glasses are not always minerals because inside their atoms are not always arranged in a specific pattern. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so again, most rocks are going to be made up of many different minerals, two or more, that is the polymineralic ones, but there are some that are going to be made up of one mineral, which were monomineralic. All right, so what we can see here in this picture is, right, a mineral, but this is a gigantic mineral. This is what is known as a geode, right, and just to give you guys an idea, right, this person here is about the same size as me. So this is a fairly large mineral. We could also see a whole bunch of other ones all in the back. All right. So some characteristics. Well, the biggest thing that we're going to use to figure out anything that we need to know about minerals is going to be our reference tables, page 16. So this is the back cover. All right. And when we take a look at it, this is the back page of the minerals. Right? And over here on the right hand side is your mineral name. All right. And then we're going to go through what all these different characteristics are, because that's what's going to help us identify the minerals. So when we try and classify, meaning identify a mineral, there's going to be two major things. Okay, we're going to take a look at the physical properties, right? The physical properties we're going to have listed below. We're going to go through them, right? And their chemical properties, meaning um, how they react to different things, what they are made of. So the physical properties are going to be big. We can actually test most of these. So that's what we're going to go through right now. All right, so what are the physical properties of a mineral? Well, to start, if we're looking at our reference tables, right, physical properties are going to be most of these things right across the top here. What we have known as luster, hardness, cleavage or fracture, um, the colors a little bit, some of their distinguishing characteristics, and even maybe some of their uses are going to be some of their physical characteristics. So let's take a look at those. Starting with all physical properties all right, are going to be based on the internal arrangement of the atoms, meaning this is what we can't see, the inside of the mineral. So 
the that inside structure. So if we take a look at two different houses, now I know these are extremes, but if we take a look at two different houses, ask yourself, which house is going to be stronger? Well, clearly this one here on your left is going to be stronger. Why? Well, what is this house made of? It's made of bricks. The bricks are piled one on top of another. It has a very strong structure. Now, while this house looks kind of old and beat up, yes it is, but is wood as strong as bricks? No, it's not. We could see that we have, you know, that wood frame inside, but this house is clearly going to be stronger here on the left because of that internal structure. So let's take a look at some of that, right? Our first thing that we're gonna look at, and we're going to be able to test these, right, is going to be hardness. So hardness is described as the resistance of a mineral to being scratched, right? And we use what is known as the Mohs scale, okay? So we have to be able to test how hard a mineral is and the way that we do that first, right? In order to find the hardness, you're going to use some common objects of known hardness to compare and see if they will scratch, meaning hurt the mineral, okay? So this is what is known as the hardness range of that mineral. So in this case, we are not going to figure out an exact number for a mineral's hardness. We're going to figure out a range and then we'll jump to the reference tables and we'll be able to figure out, right, what that mineral would be based on where it falls in this area here, okay? So this is the Mohs scale here on your left, all right? Minerals, these are all common minerals that we are going to be able to take a look at. Talc has a hardness of one, very, very, very soft. Gypsum has a hardness of two. Calcite, three. And all the way down to diamond, which has a hardness of 10. This is the hardest substance on our planet, diamonds. Okay, now the common objects that we're going to use are listed over here. So we're going to use our fingernail. All right, so everybody has fingernails, even if you chew them off a little bit, you have a fingernail. A fingernail has a hardness of 2.5. So if we were to take our fingernail, we would be able to scratch gypsum and talc because our fingernail is a harder a higher hardness than these two things, but it would not scratch anything down here. If our fingernail cannot scratch a mineral, then we pick up a penny. So what can a penny scratch? Well, a penny can scratch calcite. It will also be able to scratch gypsum and talc, but we know that it would be harder than that because of the fingernail. Right. After that, we have an iron nail with a hardness of 4.5. Then we have a glass plate of 5.5 and a steel file of 6.5. Now, these objects are listed on the bottom of your notes. So let's take a look at this. So here are all those common materials. We would be using this in our labs to figure this out. So let's just take a quick look. All right. Your fingernail. All right, a mineral that can be scratched with our fingernail. So our fingernail has a hardness of 2.5. We jump to the reference tables. Hardnesses, we take a look here. All right, we know hardness one to two. So the mineral name is graphite. So graphite can be scratched with your fingernail. All right, none of these will be scratched by your fingernail. So now we're going to come down. All right, this one, this one, this one, and even this one might be scratched. So we have muscovite, selenite gypsum, sulfur, and talc can all be scratched by your fingernail. All right, so we'd list maybe one of them. All right. A penny, but not your fingernail. So now we want a range between 2.5 and 3.5. Okay, so 2.5 to 3.5. So no, yes, no, no. So we have up here, we have galena. Then we come down here. These are all softer than our fingernail, also softer than our fingernail, but now we have 2.5, 2.5 to 3, 3, and 3.5. So these four minerals are going to be scratched. So we have dolomite, calcite, biotite, halite, right, and muscovite will all fit in that category. Next, we have an iron nail, but not a penny. So an iron nail is a hardness of 4.5, a penny is a hardness of 3.5. So again, we'd look for minerals that fall within that range. So nothing up here because these are softer and these are harder. So we come down here, right? These are all softer. We're looking for 3.5 to 4.5. So this one's good. This one's good. This one's too hard. So we have these two minerals. So we have dolomite and fluorite can be scratched by our iron nail. Okay. So now 
Last one, a glass plate, but not an iron nail. So a glass plate has a hardness of 5.5, iron nail 4.5. So again, we're going in between. So 4.5, yes, yes, all the way up to 5.5. No good. So now we have these two. So pyroxene and amphibole and maybe magnetite. Okay, so see how that works with hardness? All right, so that's how hardness works when we actually test it. Next, we have what is known as the way a mineral breaks. And this, very importantly, is determined by the internal arrangement of atoms, meaning how it's built. So minerals can break in two different ways. The first way is known as cleavage. And when we look for cleavage, cleavage is going to be an even break. So it's going to break leaving one or more flat sides. So we have three different pictures here with cleavage. Okay, cubic cleavage, the mineral is going to break into little cubes. Rhombohedral cleavage is essentially a square that is bent. All right, so again, cleavage is an even break where you have one or more flat sides. So let's take a quick look at some. All right, this is cubic cleavage. Notice here is one piece, but if you take a look at this, which is all broken up, notice that all of these have squared off cubic sides. Every single one looks similar to one another. They might be different slightly sizes, but they all have that 90 degree angle. Next, here's that rhombohedral, right? Again, we can see it might look similar to what we just looked at, but notice that these are all bent. It doesn't come straight up like this and go over, right? Like these did. Right? This is kind of bent to the side. This is known as rhombohedral cleavage. Then we have what is known as basal cleavage. These minerals are really, really cool because if you pick them up, you can actually peel them apart. It's like taking a notebook and um, separating it into the different sheets of paper. Okay. Right? The second type of breakage is known as fracture. Right? How does fracture work? Well, fracture is the opposite of cleavage. Okay, so fracture is an uneven breaking, all right, meaning that there are no flat sides and no pattern. So uneven break, fracture, even break, flat sides, cleavage. And when we take a look at these pictures here, we can see that there are no shapes that are similar. All right, here's some examples of fracture. All right, this is known as conchoidal fracture, right, where it's kind of broken and scooped out. So you see all these wavy sides. Notice there are no squares, no cubes, no rhombuses, nothing even. Next, we have something known as Hackley fracture, right? and this has nothing that looks even or the same, everything. It just kind of looks bumpy. Right? And lastly, we have what is known as splintery fracture, where you could see, um, all, see all these lines, right? If you were to try to break it, it would literally break apart and splinter, kind of like taking a piece of wood and breaking it. Okay, so let's take a quick look and review. I'm showing you these two pictures. They are two different minerals. These minerals are all the same. Now, which one shows cleavage? Which one shows fracture? So remember, cleavage is even, right? Even and flat. I apologize, my handwriting is terrible, right? And fracture is uneven. Okay, so which one shows fracture? Clearly, the one on the left is going to show fracture. We have no similar shapes, right? And over here, we have flat surfaces, right? And I'm just going to highlight, there is a very nice cube break. Here is a nice cube break, okay? Here is another nice cube break. And we even see inside, see this right here? There is a nice cube break. Same thing here. See these lines, right? Here is another nice cube break. And also all of these have these kind of right angles on the side, right? For their general shape. Okay, so that's the difference. Next, we have luster. This is probably gonna be one of the easier ones to identify. So with luster, this is gonna be the shine from a mineral surface. And generally we break this down into two different types of lusters. Now you have to put aside the idea if something is shiny or not, all right? Now we have to think of it as either metallic or non-metallic. Now a metallic is going to look like metal, whether it is shiny or dull, because we know sometimes metal rusts. So there's kind of a cheat to this, all right? We'll come back to it and I'll talk about this in a little bit. But if a mineral is metallic, it is going to leave a dark streak. Now, what do I mean by that? 
So I'm going to jump to the reference tables. And here are our two lusters. We have on top, we have the metallic lusters. And here on the bottom, these are all non-metallic. So your metallic lustered rocks, if we take a look at the distinguishing characteristics, black streak, gray black streak, black streak, green black streak. All right, and then hematite here, which is special, can be either metallic or non-metallic, and I'll show you that, right, has a red-brown streak. If we look at all of these other ones, there's only one non-metallic mineral that leaves a streak if you read through the distinguishing characteristics, and that one is sulfur, and sulfur leaves a white-yellow streak, and sulfur is very easy to identify because it is yellow to amber in color, meaning it is just a bright yellow mineral. Okay, now, next we have non-metallic. These just don't look like metal, right? Now, if you can't tell the difference between the two, this right here, that dark streak, is your deciding characteristic, all right? Uh, uh, your deciding factor, all right? Your metallic minerals will leave a dark streak. Your non-metallic ones will not. Now, this does not true... It, it, it's not true for every mineral, mineral on Earth. It's only true for the ones on our reference tables. All right, that brings us to streak, okay? What is a streak? Well, a streak is going to be the color of a mineral when you powder it. So when we test minerals, we'd get these kind of white plates, okay? These nice square white plates, and you would take the mineral and you would drag the mineral across the plate, okay? That's the mineral's powder. Okay, it's like taking a pencil and writing it across a sheet of paper. When you do that, the pencil actually leaves behind a streak. Pencils are made up of graphite, and just in case you didn't realize it, graphite is a mineral. It says pencil lead right there. Right? Graphites are a mineral, and that's what's inside your pencil. So, the streak is unique to the mineral, right? and as we can see here, this one has a lighter brown streak. This one has a black to dark brown streak. We could tell them apart. Okay, so it is very, very, very important to remember that the streak of a mineral is not a hardness test, all right, because minerals with a hardness of more than six will actually scratch this plate and it's, we're not going to be able to see it. So it is not a hardness test, all right, the streak plate is only used to streak a mineral and see its powdered color, that's it. Okay, next we have color. All these minerals are going to be very pretty colors, but color is the used, the least useful way, I apologize, the least useful way to identify a mineral. Why is that? Well, let me show you an example. Many different minerals are going to have the same color, right? We have quartz, we have calcite, we have halite. All three of these can be clear in color, right? Now, they have definitely different shapes and other characteristics, but when only looking at their color, all three of these look the same. So many minerals can have the same color. Ah, here's something else though. The same mineral may have many different colors. So these examples here are all the same mineral. They are all quartz. Okay, so we have our regular quartz here. We kind of have a smoky quartz there, right? This is a pink quartz, a rose quartz. This here is known as amethyst, which is a purpley type quartz, right? And I'm not exactly sure of the other names of these, but they are all different types of quartzes. They're all the same mineral. So many minerals can have the same color, right? and the same mineral can have many different colors. So when doing this, you just want to describe as many of the colors as you can see. Now, why is that? Well, if you look at the reference tables, common colors, silver to gray, metallic silver, black to silver, brassy yellow. So you see that the word silver is in there a couple times, so that might not actually help us, right? White to green, yellow to amber, white to pink or gray, colorless to yellow, colorless to white. So the colors are only common colors. They're not the color. So colors are the least useful. Now, how does this help? If you're looking at a mineral that is black, and when you're looking at the reference tables, if your only choices are light and color, meaning colorless to clear, colorless to white, you've probably made a mistake in one of your other identifying characteristics. Go back and recheck. 
okay? So again, here are many different colored versions of the same mineral. And as before, these are all different versions of quartz. Okay, so a couple of extra tests, all right? Next, we have what is known as an acid test, all right? Certain minerals will bubble when hydrochloric acid is placed on it. Now, in the lab, we will actually get to test this. So if you were to take a mineral and put a very small drop of hydrochloric acid on it, right, it will bubble these minerals, right? And now we're going to go to the distinguishing characteristics. I'm just going to scroll down a little bit, right? It says it right here, bubbles with acid and bubbles with acid when powdered. So that means calcite will bubble with acid. Dolomite, you have to powder the mineral, meaning you have to scratch it and break it, and only the powder will bubble. But only these two will bubble with acid. Okay, taste. Now, never, never, never should you ever taste a mineral, but one particular mineral has a very easily identifiable taste. And I've told you every day since day one of class, don't eat dirt. Well, inside of dirt is some minerals and you eat dirt every day or parts of dirt and you don't even realize it. All right. Halite, which is known as rock salt, has a salty taste. If you put salt on food at home, you eat dirt, meaning you eat halite right so here is halite right right there halite is a food additive right cubic cleavage salty taste again please don't eat it next we have magnetism right certain minerals will react with a magnet meaning they will attract to it so magnetite is that mineral and it will attract some metals for example if you have a paper clip or if you have a metal pen or um, maybe even a staple all right, so magnetite, I'm going to jump up. Here is magnetite over here, one of the metallic minerals. It has a black streak. It is magnetic, right? And it is an ore of iron, meaning it has iron in it. Okay, so those are just some extra tests that may help you figure out your minerals. All right, so some questions. This is just going to take us through the reference tables. So what is the hardness of the mineral olivine? jump to the reference tables. We're going to look for hardness. So we're looking at this first column. So come all the way down. We find olivine. Here is olivine. So olivine has a hardness of 6.5. And this is a very pretty version of olivine. Most of the olivine that we would look at is not going to look this nice. Next, how does pyroxene break? Meaning, does pyroxene cleave or fracture? So again, we find pyroxene. So here is pyroxene. Now, I know we didn't jump to the reference tables when I was looking at it, but here is our breakage, cleavage or fracture. If your check mark is over here on the left, it's cleavage. If your check mark is over here on the right, that is fracture. So we scroll down. Here is pyroxene. The check mark is on the left. So scroll up, right? We have cleavage. So pyroxene cleaves two directions at 90 degrees. Well, where did I get this extra part? All right, pyroxene. Again, down here, right? We know that it cleaves, but it cleaves at two directions at 90 degrees, meaning if you have a 90 degree angle, that you means you're going to have cubes. And these, right, are that 90 degree angle. Here's the first one there, and here's the second one. And we can see it. There is a nice broken spot, cubic cleavage. Right? Next, what is the chemical symbol for sulfur? So jump back, chemical symbol, right? So that means the composition, all right? So our composition is this column here. So sulfur is only S. What is that, all right? So we're just going to scroll all the way down to the bottom. Here are our chemical symbols on the bottom, all right? And we look for the S. S stands for sulfur. So what is the chemical symbol for sulfur? The chemical symbol is just S. And here is that very pretty, nice, bright yellow colored mineral. Next, we have what is the luster of galena okay so galena scroll to the top right galena is over here right and we want the luster so galena has a metallic luster right galena has a metallic luster and again we could see this is a nice shiny looking metal and finally what is talc used for so what is talc used for this would be your uses column so we'll go down here is talc Talc is used in ceramics and paper. So what is talc used for? Ceramics and paper. 
okay? So that is the physical properties of minerals, okay? And those are going to be your different tests. So you have your luster, your hardness, your breakage, meaning cleavage or fracture, the different colors you'll look for, and then your distinguishing characteristics and your uses, right, can be your streak, right, and any other information that might help you, okay? So those are your main physical characteristics for the minerals. We're going to stop this video here. I know there's another section of notes. I'm going to make a second video to finish that up. Again, if you have any questions with this, please feel free to reach out to me on Teams or Remind, and I will gladly answer any of your questions.